handle that. Very different thing than when you're sort of on the run and just surviving and just facing the crises of, of someone trying to, to kill you like Saul was doing with David. Here in 2 Samuel, this is, this is David now being handed, the, being put on the throne and handed the power. And how is he going to handle that? What's he going to do with that? And if we think, well, that's a million miles from me. I don't have a throne. I don't have a title. I don't have those responsibilities. Well, but if we stop and think, each one of us has something we're responsible for. People we're responsible for. People even that we have authority over, if you have any kind of responsibility for people in your work. People um, who are small and running around your feet. You know, as, as, the, as, the, uh, as a sign in a, a friend's house I saw recently. Who are all these kids and why do they keep calling me mom? You know, I mean, we have just those of us who have children running around. We have ABC and we have children. We have a certain amount of, it doesn't feel like it sometimes, but we have a certain amount of power, responsibility to guide these kids, at least for an hour every week. How do we handle the power and the responsibility that's given to us? That's a big, I think, a big picture view of what's going on in 2 Samuel. But through it, it's not just to go here, look at how David did it perfectly, because you see pretty quickly he didn't. It's to see the, the things where he was successful, but also where he failed, and ultimately to make us think about how God himself takes the power that he has with the character that he has and, and brings about his plan. Because, I mean, let's face it. If you believe in God, as I, I hope all of us do here this morning, God, is, God has almighty power. There's nothing he can't do. Who are we when we stand before him? And little us for our short little time on earth before the almighty God who's eternal. And how are we going to know how he's going to deal with us? How are we going to know his character? How can we know that we can trust him? Because there's probably been different people with authority in your life from time to time who have let you down, who have not been trustworthy, who have even abused their position of authority over you. Is God any different? Can we trust him? Can we trust his word? Well, those are the kinds of big questions that, that I think come out of 2 Samuel. But here in 2 Samuel chapter 9, David is now in a position where he's won some victories, and now he has, he's taking his first steps to, to kind of do what he thinks is right. And one of the first things he does is to remember a promise that he made. A promise that he made to his best friend, Jonathan. So let's read in chapter 9 and verse 1. And David said... Is there still anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness? We'll come back to that word. That I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake. Now there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba, and they called him to David. And the king said to him, Are you Ziba? And he said, I am your servant. And the king said, Is there not still someone of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God to him? Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan. He is crippled in his feet. The king said to him, where is he? And Ziba said to the king, he is in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel at Lodabar. Then King David sent and brought him from the house of Machir, the son of Amiel at Lodabar. And Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and paid homage. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, behold, I am your servant. And David said to him, do not fear, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. And I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your father. And you shall eat at my table always. And he paid homage and said, What is your servant that you should show regard for a dead dog such as I? Then the king called Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, All that belonged to Saul and to all his house I have given to your master's grandson. And you and your sons and your servants shall till the land for him and shall bring in the produce that your master's grandson may have bread to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, shall always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then Ziba said to the king, according to all that my lord the king commands his servant, so will your servant do. 
So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons, and Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all who lived in Ziba's house became Mephibosheth's servants. So Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, for he ate always at the king's table. Now he was lame in both his feet. It's a really, it's a touching story, isn't it? When you see someone with that much power, they come and they, they come to someone who's utterly weak. They don't have the place of their, the position of their, their grandfather's role as king. Their father is dead now. They, they don't, and on top of all that, if we, if we had read, um, read earlier that, that the reason he's lame in both his feet is because when people in the palace heard that the king and his son, Jonathan had been killed, they all ran for it and his nurse dropped him. So even back to the time of the defeat was the time when he, he became lame. And he was just constantly reminded, even by the fact that he couldn't walk, that he had lost everything. But here comes the, the king now who had a lot to, to fear in some way. Well, quite a bit to fear from someone in his position because he was in the line of the previous guy. And in that time, what you usually would have done would have just been to go kill off the family to make sure none of them could claim the throne. David comes and says, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to raise you up. You're going to sit with me at my table. I'm going to provide for you. I'm going to give you all that land that was kind of my right as the king who took over from the king. I'm handing that back. You have that now. You can support yourself. But as for your own food, I'm sharing my own table with you. And it's a tremendously touching story. But if we ask why he did that, well, at the start, it says it. He, his question is, is there anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And that word kindness is a really key word for this whole big section that we're coming into in 2 Samuel. Because it's, it's a word that's, kindness probably is kind of weak in English. In Hebrew, it's chesed. I tried, I practiced that a long time before I could get the scratchy thing in my throat when I said that. I hope you appreciated that. Chesed. But that word, it, it's not just kindness. It maybe is translated sometimes loving kindness. But the whole idea of it is that it's a particular kind of love. Like in English, we just say love. You know, we, I love you. And I love you. I love, or, you know, I love, I love to play football and I love my wife. Like, hopefully there's a difference there, right? But, you know, and there is. Let me hasten to say. But we just kind of throw love over everything. But this word is a particular kind of love. And it's, it's loyal love. It's love that, is used, that God uses when he's talking about the kind of love he has when he enters into a covenant with people, that he makes a promise. He says, I'm going to keep my word, as we were thinking earlier. I'm going to keep my word. I'm going to promise to do this, and I'm going to be faithful to you because I've brought you into that covenant. That's the way God uses it. And David is saying, I made a promise to my best friend that when I came to the throne, I would look after those of his house. And today I'm going to keep that. So it's a loyal love that motivated him to do that. So if we have that idea, that's, that's loyalty. That's the kind of love that, that gladdens God's heart because it's his kind of love to us. What have we remembered here this morning? Bread, his body, the Lord Jesus's body that he gave for us, the, this, this wine and the cup that it reminds us of the cup that he he shared out with his disciples at the last supper saying this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood i'm making a promise with you here when you come to me i'm entering into this relationship with you this new covenant that had been foretold in the old testament that i'm going to write my laws in your in on your minds and on your hearts I'm going to be your God and you're going to be my people. I'm going to teach you. And this is a faithful promise that I'm going to keep forever. I'm bringing you into this covenant. It's a covenant love. And it's that kind of thing we, we still remember to this day. We remember week by week when we take that cup. So it gladdens the heart of God. And David gets it right in this story. In the next one, things become a little bit complicated. We won't read the whole thing, but in chapter 10 of 2 Samuel, just, just read the, the first bit. After this, the king of the Ammonites died, and Hanun, his son, reigned in his place. And David said, I will deal loyally or kindly with Hanun, the son of Nahash, as his father dealt loyally 
with me. It's the same idea again. Here's somebody, we don't know all the details, but this, this foreign king from across the Jordan River, um, what's now Amman, Jordan, Ammon, um, it only dawned on me when I was in, in that country recently that that's the same place, but I should have got it from the similar name. But that it's just right across there. That The king of that land, he came and did, he was loyal to David, not just in a, in a let's, let's be buddies kind of a way, but he showed him in some way that we're not told about exactly, friendship. When he was on the run from Saul, he brought him, he, he let him be treated well in a time when he could have gone and, and helped Saul out, but he went and helped David. And David remembered this. He said, he's dealt in that kind of faithful, loving way with me. Now, now he's gone. I want to assure his son here. I'm going to deal in a faithful, loving way with you. I remember what, how your father dealt with me, and I'm going to deal in that way with you. Let's keep that relationship going. Hanun was a different kind of character than Mephibosheth. Because as you read down through there, his, his servants come along and say, here, listen, do you really think that David is going to, is, is here for your good or he's trying to be, you know, honoring your father? No, he's, he just sent these guys in to spy on us. He's just going to take over. So the doubt, the cynicism, you can, you can just hear it. He won't accept David's word for what, for what he says. And they said, no, we're going to, he said, I'll tell you what, take those guys and show, show David what this relationship is like now. That we're gonna that we're gonna have war, and so they took and they they shaved off half the beards. And I assume that means half this way, and I assume so. They shaved off half their beards, cut off half their clothes, like from the hips down, and sent them away. So half naked and half shaved. And in that culture, to the beard was a much more important thing, and it would have been shameful for them to show up in public that way. So he knew how to get at them. So David says, look, just stay down at Jericho till your, your beards grow back and then come back. And then suddenly the Ammonites realize, uh oh, we've really, I mean, they should have known. But a war starts, and this war carries on all the way to the end of chapter 12. But here you've got somebody who hears this offer of loyal love from the king, from King David, and goes, yet yeah, no, no thanks. I won't have that. And I don't think you have to reach too far to see a comparison with the Lord, do we? Here, as we've talked about, here's, here's him saying, I'm going to show you my love by laying down my life for you. I'm going to give up everything to win you. And some people hear that message, and maybe some of us have heard that, and I don't know everybody here. Maybe some are still in that place. But some of us have heard that message in the past and just went, no. I don't trust you. Yeah, I know you, you say you're doing there, but I think really you're just trying to be in control of me. You're trying to take away my freedom here. You're trying to, you're trying to stop me from living my best life. You're trying to just win in a way that, that I won't let you. And all of the mistrust comes in. To say to the one who died for us, you loving like that is, doesn't, doesn't, doesn't really make any difference to me. I'm going to fight you actually on this. So two very different reactions. How do we respond to the love of someone much greater than David? To say, I'm going to love you with a loyal love that is going to go beyond death. And I'm going to prove it by giving my life for you. And it's a tragic thing to see what happens there. So it's really interesting if you jump if you jump ahead later there once david this is a, this is a few weeks down the road you have to wait for it but when david um has his son try to take the throne absalom comes and chases him and he runs for it there are three men who come into david in the wilderness and meet him and one of them from all that we can see i mean he's another son of hanun i'm sorry of the son of the king of the Ammonites, whose brother was Hanun. And you read about him later, and he was one of the guys who came and brought to David food and bedding and what they needed to survive in the wilderness. So isn't it something? Somebody, two sons even, of the same king, made very different decisions about David. And one, even when he could have rubbed it in, came to him in his weakness and said, I'm going to help. 
But all that just to try to get our thinking back into Samuel, because here you've got a series really of, of love stories, stories about loyal love. But then after chapter 10, of course, we crash right into chapter 11. And David has this huge fall. He commits adultery with the wife of one of his soldiers who's out fighting for him, fighting actually the Ammonites who he's just gotten into all this trouble with. And he decides just based on his own desires of his body and of his mind that he's, and because he can as king, he can take that woman and sleep with her. And he does. And then finds out that he's got her pregnant. And then to cover that up, he tries to get the husband to come back and sleep with her and the husband just won't. And then so when he realizes he can't get out of that, he sets it up on the battlefield to have the husband killed. We think, what has happened to David? What, what has happened to the king of, of loyal covenant love dealing with his subjects, his, his citizens like that? And that starts to show, for one thing, just no matter how much strength one person shows, there is that just fatal flaw of human weakness that falls down at some point, that David needed someone greater than him. David needed someone who would hold on to him in loyal love. And you know, when Nathan comes and rebukes David in chapter 12, the key is this, the key thing that makes the difference is that David doesn't say, well, who is God to tell me what to do? He doesn't say, yeah, but I'm the king. I can do what I want. He listens. He hears what the word of God says to him through the prophet Nathan. And then he says, I have sinned. I am guilty. And that made all the difference for David. Because God, in his mercy, forgave David's sin. But in forgiving him, he said, there are still going to be consequences to your sin. There are going to be things that come. And knowing God as we do from how he reveals himself in this book, really it's him saying, because I've entered into this covenant of love with you, I can't just let you away with that. I can't just let, I can't just pretend that these things don't matter, that there are no consequences. So David now is going, he says, is going to have to face some of the consequences of his sin. He's going to, he, he loses the child that was born of that relationship. Though when he and Bathsheba then had another son, the Lord comes on the scene and, and says, I'm going to give him a special name, Jedidiah, which means beloved of the Lord. Solomon, in other words, it's a, Solomon comes and the Lord says, this, this one I bless. But he says to David through Nathan the prophet, in verse 10 of chapter 12, Therefore the sword shall never depart from your house, because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah, the wife, the, the Hittite, to be your wife. And I will raise up evil against you out of your own house. And he goes on to describe these things that are going to happen because David in his position as the one who was to show to everyone what God's covenant love was like, took that responsibility and just watered it up and threw it away. So in his mercy, God forgives him, doesn't, bring, doesn't, doesn't kill him, which is what he deserved. But he says, you're going to have to face these consequences, David. You're going to have to learn that sin has ongoing effects in your life and in other people's lives. And though I take away the penalty of it, there are things that are going to come as a consequence. And if we say, well, how, how is that fair? Well, to use an illustration, if someone, if someone is, is driving and goes a ridiculous amount of speed, I saw, I saw a crazy video of somebody, I think it was a stolen car the other day, and, and uh, finally plowed into the back of a car. It was... It was uh, insane to see. But if, if someone who believes and, and, and is, is a true child of God even, 
and says, in a moment of madness, just does this. And they go to God afterwards and said, I, I sinned. I was wrong to do that. God will forgive them. But if they've lost a leg as a result of that accident, God's not going to go and I zapped your leg back. You know, your leg is now regrown. There are going to be consequences to that accident that they'll live with. There are going to be legal consequences. They'll have to face whatever fines, do whatever jail time. God doesn't remove all consequences when he says, I take away my penalty of you deserve death and I forgive you. I will keep in this loyal relationship with you. But through the consequences of your actions, you're going to have to learn some things here. And that is what David is about to enter into as we come into chapter 13, which we'll come into tonight. He's going to have to see, learn through the consequences of his actions, something more about his own heart and something more about what God is like. Because ultimately, God is the one, as we said, with power, who loves and wants to see justice done. How is he going to do all of that? How is he going to take all of these things and, and work out his plan? And I think from that, we can, we'll see some practical things too, to see how we, with our little bit of responsibility, however much or little we have, can take the way God is and see that lived out in our positions of power, of responsibility for our children or colleagues or, or, or employees, and even the responsibility we have over our own bodies to control and to govern this bit of flesh. So I hope that is, gives us a little bit of an idea and uh, gets our thinking back there. Um, I'll just close in prayer and then we'll have some announcements. <laughs>